It's 2008, and Alexander Lebedev is in London, working on a plan. One doesn't know whether this is a strategy for him to create some relevance for himself back in Russia and create some protection for himself back in Russia, that, that if he has a you know, major news outlet in the UK, which is a imp hugely important country for Russia, that would give him certain high marks from the authorities so that um, he's allowed to live in peace. It's only a matter of weeks since Alexander's Moscow tabloid reported allegations that Vladimir Putin was leaving his wife for a young gymnast and was forced to close. By 2008, everybody knew that falling out with President Putin could spell ruin, personally and financially. Alexander's fellow oligarch, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, was three years into a nine-year sentence on trumped-up fraud charges. But there were worse prospects. A break with Putin could be fatal, as Alexander Litvinenko found out. So it wouldn't be surprising if Alexander Lebedev's mind was racing, that he was looking for a safe haven if he needed to leave Moscow in a hurry. Maybe the best plan was one that had worked before. It also mirrored uh, the strategy of oligarchs in Russia 20 years earlier. So oligarchs in Russia, people who owned banks, people who owned oil companies, people who owned other things, would buy newspapers and TV stations not because they made money, but to buy them to gain political influence. The strategy that came together in Alexander Lebedev's mind was to buy a British newspaper. Well, it didn't seem like a very good investment strategy, <laughs> but a British, these British newspapers were losing money hand over fist. The question was, could he do it? There were two main problems. The financial crisis was ripping through the global economy and shredding Alexander's personal wealth. And, awkwardly, the Joint Intelligence Committee, a group of intelligence officials that advises cabinet ministers, was worried about a former KGB man getting his hands on a newspaper. If Alexander's plan was to work, he'd need his son Evgeny's help. Alexander had the money, but it was Evgeny who knew all the right people in London. I'm Paul Caruana Galizia, and from Tortoise, this is episode 3, of London Grad. In May 2008, Evgeny was at an exhibition that he sponsored of photos of early Russian Chekhov productions. He was there with the editor of Tatler, Jordi Greig. Jordi, whose father was a royal courtier, had taken to chaperoning Evgeny around London. A few months earlier, his magazine named Evgeny as Britain's third most eligible bachelor. If you're wondering who he lost out to, it was Russell Brand and Sam Branson, Richard's son. There with him was Jolie Richardson, the glamorous actor who's about 15 years older than Evgeny, but began appearing by his side at parties and dinners. As with his other relationships with women, one person described it as more like mother and son. After the exhibition, the party went for dinner at a Japanese restaurant on St. James's Street owned by the Lebedevs, Sake Nohana. They were joined by a genuine press baron, Jonathan Harmsworth, the Ford Viscount Rodemir. He inherited the Evening Standard newspaper from his father, Vier Harmsworth, the third Viscount Rodemir. The Evening Standard is London's largest circulation paper, and one Alexander used to read as a KGB officer for signs of capitalism's decline. Now it was declining. It was losing between 10 and 20 million pounds a year, and Lord Rothermere was looking to offload it. At the restaurant, Lord Rothermere sat near Geordie, over sake and sushi, and out of Evgeny's hearing. They began a guarded conversation about the possible sale and potential new owners of the Evening Standard. The next day, Lord Rodemir and Jordi continued their conversation on the phone. Jordi said he would contact the Lebedevs to find out if they'd be interested in taking over the paper. Jordi thought it made sense, not just because Alexander had the money, but because he had the credentials. 
Alexander Stilbak Novoya Gazeta, the liberal Moscow newspaper. But it was Evgeny rather than Alexander who was Geordie's contact. So that's who he approached. Evgeny's response, Geordie said, was enthusiastic. Evgeny called his father in Moscow. Within weeks, the Lebedevs, Geordie and Lord Rodomir met in one of London's plushest hotels. The Connaught in Mayfair. It's the sort of place where the hubbub of diners, muffled by the thick carpets and pristine tablecloths, is just enough to stop a private conversation being overheard. It's the sort of place where a cup of tea costs seven pounds fifty. They were there to discuss the outlines of a deal, and like all deals that have to be done in secret, they gave it a code name: Project Venus. Formal negotiations began very quickly. Lord Rodomir was represented by the genteel investment bank Lazards. Geordie switched sides to act for the Lebedevs and brought with him Justin Byamshaw. He's a successful entrepreneur who, back in his student days at Oxford, went with Geordie to parties run by the Piers Gaveston Society, a highly exclusive dining club. It's the one behind those famously debauched sex and drugs parties you might have seen in the tabloids a few years ago. The negotiations were done in secret, in ups and downs, delays and bursts of activity over months, all amid the global financial crisis. During this time, Gazprom's share price collapsed by 70%, dragging down Alexander's wealth with it. And Germany suspended his low-cost airline Blue Wings because he delayed payments into an industry support fund. But Alexander plotted a path out of his financial troubles. He sold a jet and 11 hectares in Umbria. He made a number of journalists redundant in Novoya Gazeta's political and investigation sections, and was late paying the salaries of the staff who were left. He cancelled plans to launch a Russian version of the magazine, Dazed and Confused, and refused to pay its launch team. One member of that team accused Alexander of acting like a 90s oligarch bandit, and said, I think Lebedev is prepared to rob Russian journalists while being a good liberal guy to the British ones. Alexander told his business partners that he wanted to buy the newspaper for the benefit of Russia, and would only do it if the Kremlin said yes. One pound sold. That's the amount rumored to be behind the nominal sum announced in the official statement. In the end, Alexander scratched together enough to buy 76% of the evening standard from Lord Rodomir for one pound, and the commitment to invest 25 million pounds. More than six months of negotiations and Alexander Lebedev is now the first Russian to own a leading UK newspaper. Project Venus was complete. I mean, it's extraordinary some of the people who have been able to come and go into the UK and who have been allowed to buy newspapers obtain nationality for their children, all the rest of it. People that work for the KGB worked within the KGB against Britain and against Britain's interests, undeniably, including Alexander Lebedev, of course. It was really 2008 he started moving to buy the newspapers. W what did you think then? Because you must have known about his past. To see him buy a major newspaper, how, how, what did you think of it in that moment? I, I don't understand how that could be allowed to come about, um, quite apart from any of the specifics, the idea that you would, you would allow uh, you know, a national newspaper or a national media outlet uh, to be owned by a former KGB officer who had worked against Britain in his posting here is it, just extraordinary. I, I don't understand how that can be, be allowed. So Alexander, in his defence, says, you know, I, le I left government service in 92. Um, I'm now a banker. D what, what do you make of that? Well, as, as Putin himself has said, Raz Chekist, Sigdar Chekist, one, once you're an intelligence officer, you're a Russian intelligence officer particularly there, you're always an intelligence officer. Certainly Putin's view is that these people have a lifelong obligation to, to, to the state and to the government. 
Jordi, for his service to father and son, was given a 5% stake in the Evening Standard and made editor. It was the first of his big newspaper jobs. Next for him would be the editorship of Lord Rodemir's Mail on Sunday, then the Daily Mail. When Alexander was asked whether Evgeny would be the paper's publisher, as people thought, he said, I will wait and see. He has changed a lot in the past four to five years when he liked frolicking in the south of France. Evgeny had changed. Now he criticised the idle rich. People he saw, as he put it, lying on beaches with supermodels snorting coke. His father seems to have been satisfied. Just shy of 30, Alexander put Evgeny in charge of the standard. Ladies and gentlemen, press freedom is a universal ideal, but its currency differs around the world. In Russia, people die for it. So it is not something we take lightly. Like Christine, the Joint Intelligence Committee, that cabinet office body I mentioned, which advises ministers on security risks, had been worried about a former KGB officer taking over the newspaper. At least one of its members was concerned that Russian agents could come into the UK undercover as journalists. And there were worries that the takeover would set a worrying precedent for foreign ownership of British media. Not long after, Alexander used the Project Venus template to buy the independent newspaper as well, not just a London title, a national one. He raised the money this time by selling his quarter stake of the Russian airline, Aeroflot, and the jet leasing company he owned for $575 million to a Kremlin-controlled bank. A bank headed by none other than Vladimir Putin. It was a classic oligarch shakedown. Putin got a 20% discount on the market value of the deal. Still, Alexander joked, with the sum he made, he could probably buy all of the newspapers in Britain. He got the independent for a pound up front and a commitment to invest nine and a quarter million pounds. And he put Evgeny in charge of that too. For Evgeny, it was time to close the party boy chapter in his life. Now he had to become a serious person, or at least put on a costume which would make him look like one. In no time at all, he'd be whining and dining the future Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. So we're on Derry Street, uh, looking at Northcliffe House, an enormous Art Deco building, uh, shops downstairs, very grand, very grand Art Deco windows, um, revolving door entrance, and of course home, home to the evening standard. It's also home to the Independent, which Alexander had just bought, and to Evgeny's private office. Not a grand one. In fact, it was on the flimsy side. The walls were so thin that when Evgeny once called a journalist to a meeting and left them waiting outside for two hours, the journalist could hear everything from inside. In that case, Evgeny was talking to one of his assistants about guests for his chat show on London Live, the television channel his father had bought. And the suggestions became increasingly bizarre before they moved on to what Evgeny should wear. Evgeny's office was his power centre. It marked how far he'd travelled by this point, and in a funny way, what a short distance he'd actually covered as well. Northcliffe House is in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. It's a very short walk away from the Lebedev's first London home on Earl's Terrace, and from Evgeny's primary school, St. Barnabas and St. Philip's. It's also just a few minutes from Alexander's old workplace, the Soviet Embassy, now the Russian Embassy on Kensington Palace Gardens. Now it was where Evgeny was still trying to establish himself as a serious person. He'd wound down the Raiza Gorbachev Foundation a year earlier 
to settle into his role as newspaper proprietor. But it wasn't a natural fit for him. So his father surrounded him with a close group of assistants and advisors, chief among them Justin Byam Shaw, who'd helped negotiate the Evening Standard deal. Evgeny's private office grew. He had a social media person, a bodyguard, a fashion advisor, a social secretary, a media advisor, an editor, and a journalist. For his closest aides and editors, the job could be grueling. Evgeny expected instant replies to text messages. One of his staffers remembers a stream of unanswered texts from him. There were late night calls, sudden flights, never ending requests for this or that, searching out people to come to his parties, lining up people to have their photos taken with him. But if you could stick it out, the rewards could be substantial. Amal Rajan advised Evgeny for 18 months before Evgeny made him the editor of The Independent at 29, with instructions to close the loss-making paper. Evgeny promised him the Evening Standard's editorship once he'd done it. But when Evgeny's promise didn't materialise, Amal left. He's now the BBC's media editor. Meanwhile, Evgeny was still working on his image and setting about it in a very thorough way building that serious person, piece by piece. I believe at that time, he was beginning to awaken to a new level, another level of creative excellence. And a tremendous amount was being demanded of him. He hired the services of Stuart Pierce, a master of voice. Evgeny is an extraordinarily private man immensely sensitive. You know, he has a pedigree of sensitivity, which is really refined. And so uh, being in the public domain is not an easy position for him, at least it was at that time. He has a very profound destiny and he does such great work. If you're a very private person, but you're called to greatness, as we saw with George VI, it's very challenging and it must be a hoop, so to speak, a fiery mm. hoop that he's constantly jumping through. And so my role with Evgeny was to rediscover a new language so that he could actually create the role that was being demanded of him. Evgeny may not have been desperately serious, one of his former staffers told me, but being part of that inner circle sounds like a lot of fun. We had to pitch ideas to Evgeny, he told me. We discussed him adopting an image of an oligarch meets Hunter S. Thompson, or him going on strictly calm dancing. The job of the journalist based in his private office was usually to arrange interviews to be done by Evgeny and then write them up. Someone who did that job recalls arranging an interview with Evo Morales, who was president of Bolivia at the time. But they had to scrap it when Evgeny realised that La Paz airport was at too high an altitude for his private jet to land. One interview that did go ahead was with Europe's last dictator, Alexander Lukashenko of Belarus. We basically ended up doing a film about Britain's youngest newspaper proprietor, uh, son of a Russian oligarch, uh, securing uh, the, and doing this interview with Alexander Lukashenko, which was a huge deal at the time. This is Natalia Antelava. She's the editor-in-chief and co-founder of the newsroom Coda Story. But back in 2011, she was working on Newsnight for the BBC. In the meeting the night before, Lebedev was telling me that he really wanted to ask him, you know, really tough questions and I talked to him about, um, you know, democracy and the West and, um, you know, I, and he was like sort of in this combative mood, sort of, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give him a hard time. So I was looking forward to seeing how that dynamic would play out. And what was very clear the minute that man walked into the room is that he was in charge. And as they sat down and started the conversation, Lukashenko just got on top of Lebedev and he never gave up that position. Like, he was in control. Except for one moment, when Evgeny Lebedev's questions took a strange turn. Lebedev said to him, so, Mr. President, what is your opinion on group sex? 
and we just and I just thought what excuse me what uh but it, Lukashenko's reaction was priceless too because he just paused and that was I mean I have to give it to Lebedev that was one time when he like stopped Lukashenko in his tracks it was only after the BBC had stopped filming that it became obvious that the interview had almost certainly been orchestrated and arranged by Evgeny's father, Alexander. So when the interview was over, everyone stood up and Lukashenko said, how's your father? And he said, you know, he said he sends his regards and Lukashenko said, end a message. And Lebedev said, yes, it was it, it was an exchange along these lines. But my assumption was that the father had helped it happen. And the two of them disappeared into a room and it lasted for about half an hour, or 40 minutes, whatever they talked about. But the real prize for the Lebedevs wasn't a post-Soviet dictator. It was Britain's leader. In the grounds of Hampton Court Palace in London, surrounded by grasslands where deer have roamed freely since Henry VIII lived here, is Stud House. It's an elegant and historic home, one that the Lebedevs bought for about £12 million in 2007, spending yet more on its renovation. Candelabras, designed by Theo Fennel, depicting bodies in various erotic acts, run along the dining room table. Elsewhere, a display of sex toys, butt plugs, in the shape of Vladimir Putin's head and torso, designed in protest against Putin's invasion of foreign territories, a gift to Evgeny from Stephen Fry. There's a painting which Evgeny commissioned and which hangs halfway up the stairs. It's a huge crimson and gold artwork showing a military parade in Red Square. It's interesting because of the way Evgeny describes it. He says the painting represents Putin's ideology. This new kind of philosophy of a Russian state more focused on the East than on the West. On the 6th of June 2009, Stadt House was the venue for the Lebedev's fourth annual fundraiser for the Raiza Gorbachev Foundation. The follow-up to the party at Princess Diana's childhood home at Altorp, which kick-started this whole story. This one was more modest, a budget of only half a million pounds compared to the two million pounds for the first one. But it would have a similar impact. Alexander invited Boris Johnson, who'd been elected mayor of London a year earlier, to speak. He sat him next to Evgeny at dinner. It was the start of what would turn out to be a fateful friendship. A month later, Boris Johnson and Evgeny went for lunch at the Blueprint Cafe a smart restaurant near Tower Bridge. They started to call and text each other regularly and see each other more frequently. In November that year, five months after the Stadthouse party, Boris Johnson went to the Evening Standard Theatre Awards. This was a dying spot on London's social calendar, which Evgeny had resuscitated for reasons that were clear to someone who gatecrashed them. Nimrod Kramer, a self-described professional social climber, who we'll hear more from later. Here's what Nimrod thought of the awards. Award ceremonies are the method that get the most people to suck up to you, because you just give awards. And I'm pretty sure he was the one deciding who to give the awards to. It wasn't a professional committee. It was just his decision who he wanted to be friends with. In one year, three of the five independent judges on the committee resigned because the staria Helen Mirren was declared the best actor despite her barely figuring in the judging decisions and despite none of them having voted for her. Evgeny made the awards a big black tie gala. He joined forces with Anna Winto, the editor-in-chief of Vogue, who fascinated him, and he invited big stars, people like David Beckham, Naomi Campbell and Elton John, who was a friend of the Lebedev family by then. I thought it'd be great to shave the beard off of my dear friend Evgeny Lebedev. Hello, my name is Evgeny Lebedev, uh, and my darling friend, Sir Elton John, is about to take my beard off for comic relief, and I'm absolutely terrified what I look like underneath. So we're going to start the process and denude Mr. Lebedev of his facial monstrosity. It's on. Oh dear. Exactly. <laughs> 
Not long after this, Evgeny put an idea of another kind of ceremony to Boris Johnson, an annual Russian arts festival in London, backed by the Kremlin. Johnson thought it was an excellent idea. He said to Evgeny that it shouldn't glorify Russia's Soviet past. It should celebrate Russia under Putin instead. Remember, this was a state that had recently assassinated Alexander Litvinenko in London. It was part of Boris Johnson's broader approach to Russian money in London. He encouraged oligarchs to fight their divorce battles and libel claims in the city. I would never encourage anyone to sue, Johnson said. But if one oligarch feels defamed by another oligarch, it is London's lawyers who apply the necessary balm to the ego. He clashed with Chancellor George Osborne over an oligarch tax on expensive properties in the capital. For any mayor of London, the evening standard matters, and Boris Johnson worked his relationship with the paper hard. Your support, and that of the Evening Standard, is much appreciated, Johnson once wrote to Evgeny. Just eight days before London's mayoral election in May 2012, the Evening Standard ran a front-page editorial with the headline Boris Johnson, the right choice for London. I therefore declare Boris Johnson to be elected as the mayor of London. Boris Johnson won narrowly, with 51.5% of the vote. After his re-election, his relationship with Evgeny changed. It grew more intense. In October 2012, the mayor made his first trip to Palazzo Terranova, the Lebedev's villa nestled in the Umbrian hills, a part of Italy thick with Putin-friendly oligarchs. And more recently, thick with rumours about exactly what the relationship was, not just between Boris Johnson and Evgeny Lebedev, but with Alexander his former KGB agent father. We'll come back to that. Alexander Lebedev was still spending most of his time in Russia. He remarried a striking Siberian woman called Elena Perminova. She was 16 years old and he was 43 when they first met. And she was facing six years in prison for selling ecstasy and nightclubs, until her father asked Alexander for help in her case. Alexander obliged, and, thanks to his help, she escaped prison and moved to Moscow to study. In their telling, when Elena turned 18, she began dating Alexander. They fell in love and would have four children in all. Harper's Bazaar called it a Cinderella story. But the rest of Alexander's life in Russia wasn't such a fairy tale. He was still not on easy terms with Vladimir Putin. In 2012, he was charged with battery after he punched a fellow business tycoon in the face, live on Russian television. It happened in the middle of a heated debate about the global economic crisis. Alexander was on a panel with another oligarch who threatened to punch Alexander in the face. I felt threatened, but my, my point was that I need to stop it, otherwise it's going to go into, into uh, not only an insult and intimidation, but to be hit in the face. I might have overreacted. I mean, normally I'm, I'm a very quiet person and uh, I was not looking for any violation of public order. It meant he was facing a jail term of up to seven years and he was worried. So was Evgeny. You think he'll, have, he'll go to jail? He thinks he probably will. And, and what's worse, he, we also believe that there's been a contract taken out on his head in case he does go to jail. Really? There's some sinister elements that he's crossed in the past with, with his anti-corruption campaign. In the trial, Alexander presented a character reference from his former KGB boss, which described him as among the most educated and talented employees of the service. Maybe it made a difference. Alexander was convicted. But what was interesting is that he didn't spend a single day in jail, which is very unusual. If you get convicted in Russia, it's almost uh, a certain jail sentence. And so he must have had some 
political support yes. to, um, to, to avoid jail. Alexander had fallen from favor in the Kremlin, but he'd done it gradually. And he hadn't fallen so far that he couldn't come back. What he needed was an opportunity to prove himself. And in 2014, a big one came along. Pro-Russian forces today seizing Ukrainian ships in the Crimean port of Sebastopol. Shots fired, but no injuries as the Russians raised their flag. The Russian flag now flies above the Crimean parliament here in Simferopol. We understand that overnight, around about 50 unidentified armed gunmen forced their way inside the parliament building. The invasion of Crimea was a fork in the road for Alexander. He had a choice. He could cut whatever remaining ties he had with Putin, or double down, and claw his way back into favour. That's all in episode 4 of Londongrad. Thank you for listening to Londongrad. This series is reported by me, Paul Caruana Galizia. The producer is Katie Gunning. The sound designer is Tom Kinsella. The editor is Kerry Thomas.